it's 2020 and that means everyone's going to be looking back at the last 10 years and looking at all of the money they've wasted and time they've wasted playing video games. So I thought I would join in on the party of people making videos looking back at their favorite games of the decade. If you're a long time fan of the channel, most of these aren't going to be surprising at all because they've either been talked about already in previous videos or I plan to talk about them in the future. I'm going to be listing 15 games and I want to keep a rule of not mentioning multiple games per franchise. The order is just going to be based on by year of release. So so from 2010 to 2019. So just because I mentioned games later, that doesn't mean I think that they're better than the ones I mentioned first. Also, this discussion will remain spoiler free because I do want everybody to play these games. But before we get to that, I do want to have the honorable mentions. I'd argue Amnesia The Dark Descent is the reason why horror games came back into the mainstream and got really popular. It's what kicked off the YouTuber shocked face while playing horror game overreacting craze that was in the early 2010s. Channels like PewDiePie and Markiplier and all the other ones that I have no idea who they are, but those are like the two big ones that I actually know. This isn't a most influential list, but I'd argue that it's also that because it influenced horror games to come for the next decade. You could still play a first person horror game now and see the influences from Amnesia in that. Granted, some of them, not the most original from Amnesia, but Amnesia did it really well. I love the setting. The monster designs are probably the weakest aspect of it because after you see them and you get accustomed to them, they really lose their flair. And that's probably my biggest critique of it and why it isn't on this list. Once you become accustomed to the horror, it stops being scary. But still one of the most striking things from that game is the section where the invisible thing is walking in the water and you have to run away from it. That was my first introduction to the game because I went to a friend's house and I saw that scene. I was like, this is amazing. I need to play this. It also had a really dedicated mod scene back when the game was super popular and I love horror mods because it allows people who normally would not be able to make games to create really interesting horror experiences. It's the same reason why I want Half-Life Life 3. Not because I actually care about Half-Life 3, but because I want the horror mod community for Half-Life games to come back. Guilty Gear Exard, specifically Sign, was a game I was incredibly hyped for when it first got revealed. That first teaser trailer, where they did the 360 to show, no, these aren't sprites, these are 3D models, was mind-blowing. The game's soundtrack is probably one of my favorite albums, technically, ever. I'm still listening to things like Heavy Days and Big Blast Sonic. Now, six years later, that soundtrack is a 10 out of 10. The only reason why I think it doesn't make the actual list of the 15 is because it didn't have a simultaneous release with PC. The PC version came out so much later that eventually my hype slightly died for it. And because it wasn't day and day, the online community on the PC version was next to non-existent, sadly. I still love this game and I play Rev 2 whenever I get the chance. Hopefully with Strive it comes out day and day on PC because I fear if it doesn't, that game's gonna suffer a similar fate with trying to play online online on the PC SKU. Doom 2016 is like a lot of the games that are on the main list. It is a return to form for a franchise that had what I would argue is a misstep with a single release. I am personally not a very big fan of Doom 3, but I feel like Doom 2016 is a great modernization of the series. Gory kills are fun, they're fast so they don't get repetitive, combat is crunchy, music is great. The multiplayer was surprisingly fun for what little I played before it unfortunately died. My only complaint with the game is is that it's kind of short and it ends on a cliffhanger making me crave more, which I guess is a good thing, but I just wish it was longer. Maybe then it wouldn't sting as much. And I'm also incredibly excited to play Doom Eternal in just two months. Detention is probably the best Silent Hill game to come out since Silent Hill 3. I've already talked about this one in a video. There's not really much to say about it that isn't just full on spoilers, but I love the game's art style and the atmosphere. Monster designs are super interesting because they're all based on, to my understanding, Taiwanese folklore. But what keeps me from putting it on the main list is that after finishing it, while enjoying it and thinking it was really cool and digging a little bit deeper into the lore and the symbolism behind the game. I didn't really have a drive to come back to it ever again. And I can't say the same for mainline Silent Hill games. I still have the drive to go back and play 1 through 3 from time to time, but I don't feel the same for Detention. And for my final honorable mention, this may come as a surprise to some people, and that is Near Automata. And some of you may be thinking, how the fuck is this on honorable mentions and not one of my favorite games of the decade, especially knowing my tastes from watching other videos in the past. And that is because I said at the start of this video, I wanted to have a 
rule to keep one game per franchise on the list. So I'm going to use this as a transition into the actual list because my first game that is my favorite of the decade is the original Nier for the Xbox 360. Nier has been a game I wanted to make a video on for like two years now, but I really don't know what to say about it that hasn't already been said by the countless great analysis videos out there. If I do end up making one, it's probably going to echo a lot of points that I'm going to say here. Nier is a game that I end up thinking about at least once a week. And after playing it so long ago, and with how much I consume media, a lot of it doesn't really stick in my mind. I kind of just forget about it because honestly, a lot of things are really forgettable and bad. It's right up there with Berserk, with things that were so special to me that they have such a staying power and an impact on how I think and view things and how I would want to create my own story. Nier is a game that I would love to make, except maybe with some better combat, but that's besides the point. It was such an important game to my formative years of life. I can't imagine not having experienced this game. It has some of my favorite performances ever. Laura Bailey as Kaine is amazing. I'd argue to say that's her best performance ever given. The entire cast is fantastic. I can't think off the top of my head a single bad performance. The music is phenomenal. Grandma, Kaine Salvation, shit's got me crying in the club. To the average person, I think Automata is probably the better overall experience, but I absolutely adore the original game. And I would say if you can get past the slog that are some of the parts of this game and the overall serviceable combat, there is a masterpiece in the rough here, a hidden gem. There's not, it's not much hidden anymore. People know about this fucking game. It's, I would hardly say this is a cult classic anymore. It's just a classic. The next up is Fall New Vegas, the game that a lot of people would consider the only good of the modern Fallout games. I would not go as far, I do like parts of Fallout 3, but I put a disgusting amount of hours into this game, between just playing the base Xbox version before I had a PC that could run it, and then once I got it on PC, all the modded quests that I added to it. I can still remember watching channels like Al Chestbreach, I think his name was, back in the day with like Area 51 mods and shit like that. This game had limitless potential with what could go on in it. The only thing that was really holding it back was the shit engine that Bethesda forced them to use that they had to Frankenstein's monster add shit on that they wanted to. Other than the first DLC, I would say that all of them are really good. I just personally hated the exploding collar bullshit and the poison gas from the first DLC. Fallout New Vegas is probably the last open world RPG that I really enjoyed because there was so much shit to do in it. Most of the time, I feel like open world games do not justify their size, but there was just shit to do every everywhere you walked in Fallout New Vegas, which I really can't say the same for other games. The next choice should honestly come at no surprise, it almost feels like a cop-out to include on this list, and that's Dark Souls 1. Again, another game that has everything to ever say about it already said, and why I will probably never ever do a video on it. Probably. In case I come up with something funny, which I won't knowing me. I just really love the atmosphere of this game. The first half of this game's level design is impeccable. I just really love Japanese interpretations of Dark West certain fantasy. Things like this, Berserk. I haven't read it yet, but I've seen a few things, so I potentially think Claymore would apply to this list. This game has a great soundtrack and a ton of super memorable bosses. It's a shame the second half of the game is not nearly as good. The lava level Lost Isolith just hurts my eyes to go back and play, and the blatant reuse of all of the demons once you get to hell just felt really underwhelming. Next up is Dead Rising 2 Off the Record. This is going to be the first game on this list that I'm including what I would think is the better version of the two, even if I prefer aspects of the other version more. I feel like I'm probably the only person on earth who's about to say this, but I like Chuck more than Frank West in Dead Rising 2. I always felt that Chuck played off the characters in 2 far better than Frank, clearly because they were written first with Chuck in mind, but overall when comparing the wealth of content, Off the Record is the far superior game. Having more weapons, a new area, a free roam mode so you don't have to worry about the timer. This is objectively the version you should play. Good co-op games are kind of a dying breed because they're being replaced with live service games that want you and your friends to just commit your entire life to exclusively playing them. But Dead Rising has been a series that I have put countless hours into once it added the co-op option with Dead Rising 2, I believe. I don't remember if Case Zero had it or not. I really enjoyed all the creative weapons this game had. It's just kind of a shame that the series has taken a decline to where it is now now with four and I doubt we'll ever get another game. And if we do manage to get another one, I fully expect it to be another piece of shit. 
Dead Space 2 is another game that I would consider one of my favorites of all time, though my opinions of it have changed over the years. Originally, I would consider it the better of the two, but after replaying 1 and halfway replaying through 2 again recently for a video that will hopefully eventually get made this year, I think I'm starting to like 1 a lot more now, mainly due to just how my opinions on horror and my tastes in horror have changed. I still think this is an amazing game. Isaac's performance is really good in this game, which kind of makes me miss that you don't hear him at all in one because he's a silent protagonist. This game had a ton of excellent improvements to gameplay, like a bunch of the alt fires got changed to be actually good, like the pulse rifles now have a grenade launcher instead of that stupid 360 spinning crowd control thing that was super slow and terrible and you should never use. It had a multiplayer which was okay. It wasn't very well balanced, but I still found it really fun. It was made during that weird period of video games where like drink companies and fast food chains were trying to get in on the money, so there was like exclusive costumes if you drank Mountain Dew and Dr. Pepper. That was really bizarre, but I liked the designs a lot more in Dead Space 2 for suits. The few new monsters that were added to 2 were great. If you want to look at a piece of media that ramps up its horror and escalation really well, I would say the jump from Dead Space 1 to Dead Space 2 is still really good. It still feels really in-universe and nothing really, in quotes, jumping the shark in escalation, nothing really eye-rolly. It keeps things still grounded and and making sense within the context of its lore. I can see why people, even myself included, are starting to turn back to liking one over two more, but that's not to say two isn't fantastic. It's a shame about the next game, though. Okay, so I'll admit that Fire Emblem Awakening was my introduction to the series. I'm one of those fans, but I still really, really love this game. I know people are probably thinking, but what about Three Houses? I sadly just haven't gotten to it yet. My backlog is enormous, but from what I played, I really enjoyed it. Who knows, maybe it'll take its place of my favorite Fire Emblem game over Awakening, I played Echoes, Shadows of Valinthia. I liked it, not as much as Awakening, but it's good. There's just something about this game's cast that I fell in love with, that I spent countless hours just grinding out support interactions in that shipping dock mission, because it was the smallest board with a ton of enemies, so you could easily farm a bunch of interactions. I replayed through the game three times just to see a bunch of different pairings before I realized, wait, why don't I just look at the wiki to see all the different dialogue trees? I'm really happy this was my first Fire Emblem game because it left a really good first impression, and it makes me want to go back and experience all the older games, even if some of them are harder to get your hands on officially, which kind of sucks, but I'm just going to have to obtain them through very sound and legal channels. 2012 was really the year of the 3DS for me, because my next game is Bravely Default. This one I feel a little weird putting on this list because it is massively flawed, but there are just some things about this, like the character interactions, the music, the job system, which I know isn't unique to this game, just keeps me coming back and loving it, and I'm incredibly incredibly excited for Bravely Default 2 later this year. Killer Instinct was one of the two main reasons that I bought the Xbox One. <laughs> Before I sold it because I saw no reason to actually keep that console and my money was better spent elsewhere. Thankfully the game is now on PC so I could actually play it again. And that port is fucking amazing. Mwah. It is beautiful. An amazing roster, great net code, great learning tools, great soundtrack. What more could you want from a fighting game? My biggest qualm with it is I didn't like some of the changes between seasons to certain characters like Saberwolf. But that's just me being stuck in the past with season 1 Saberwolf. I'll be perfectly honest and say that I wasn't all that excited for Metal Gear Rising Revengeance when it was first shown off back in 2011. I was iffy on games notorious for being stealth games turned into a full-blown action game. This 2011 me was a fucking moron because this game is great. It has so many memorable moments. Stopping the Metal Gear Ray with your sword, Sam's shit-eating grin, Nano Machine, son. This game has so many quotable lines and so many memorable characters. Its soundtrack is fucking phenomenal. I still occasionally listen to some. Though I'm kind of a little tired of listening to them all these years later, and that's not to the fault of the songs themselves, I honestly wish I could just erase my memory and listen to Rules of Nature again for the first time. I don't think there's going to be a point where I'm not going to be sad that we're most likely never going to get a sequel to this game. I got a long, proper dev time to expand on the mechanics and figure things out, because there are some eh areas that aren't really fun to go back and play through. The ham-fisted stealth sections for a little bit, the enemies you fight aren't that interesting. It's really the bosses, the music, and the set pieces that save this game and keep it interesting still. Please give us Metal Gear Rising 2. 
Shovel Knight came out at the perfect time. The want for a new good Mega Man game was at an all-time high. This was in the dark age of Capcom where they seemed like they didn't give a fuck about anything. There was another Kickstarter going on at the same time that would eventually turn into a huge disaster. But this game was oozing charm and passion right from the get-go. I love what they do with the text and conversations in this game to emphasize drama. The game is chalk-filled with content now having all the DLCs finished and that new Smash game mode, which I admittedly haven't gotten around to playing yet. I still think it's the best Mega Man and Mega Man-like game to come out in the past decade, and I'm excited to see what Yacht Club does next. Wolfenstein The New Order was my favorite FPS of the decade. Not that there was really that much competition in my eyes, there was like Titanfall 2, Doom 2016, uh, the new Modern Warfare. All three of these are really good games that I enjoyed as well, but there's one thing that set them apart, and that was the story and narrative. BJ Blazkowicz in this game is such an interesting character to hear speak. Brian Bloom knocked it out of the park with his performance in this game. I could just listen to BJ talk and monologue about bullshit for hours in this game. New Order got me super attached to a character who up until this point was basically just a sprite of a dude's face. Hit feedback from the guns feel really nice and crunchy. The sound design is really nice. Mick Gordon, again, another game that he did a soundtrack for, though I think it's probably his weakest out of the Killer Instinct, Doom, and Wolfenstein trio. When playing through this game and even replaying it for this video to get footage, I never really noticed many tracks. There's a few that I've gone back and listened to that are actually good, but I noticed more of them from the old blood more than this game. Darkest Dungeon is another game that I put a disgusting amount of hours into. I don't know what it is about this game, but it scratches this really obscure itch that had me coming back again and again to this game. This is another game where I'm captivated by the game's narration. The Ancestor, voiced by Wayne June, has so many great quotable lines. I love the post-processing effect that they have on his voice, that slight little petering out echo at the end of all of his sentences. My only complaints with the game were I didn't like some of the balance changes that happened in the later years of this game's life and I was pretty disappointed with their second DLC, The Color of Madness. And that's honestly my fault because I didn't follow the DLC's news leading up to its release. I just bought it when it came out and I went in expecting just a similar but different DLC to The Crimson Court, which this isn't. Darkest Dungeon 2 is another game that I'm incredibly excited for. I hope we get some news in 2020. Maybe we'll be lucky with an early access release. Come on, Red Hook, I'm starving here. Give me something to work with. This next one was a really hard decision because I was split between Yakuza 0 and Yakuza 5, and I think that I should end up going with Zero. Both are incredible and dense with content, but at the same time, I can't ignore the fact that Zero basically saved the franchise in the West. This is something that I don't really know what to say without going into like great detail about the story because it's a Yakuza game. You run around, you beat motherfuckers up, you save the day, you end up being a good guy despite being a gang member. There's tons of mini games to do at the arcade and tons of stuff to do on the side like karaoke. Cutscenes are presented in a way that it makes just two dudes sitting in a room super interesting. If you want to get into this series, there's a video on my channel going in depth about what games to play in what order. This next pick is another one where I'm bumping it up to the other version even if I liked the first one more, and that is Hitman 2, because you can just play all of Hitman 2016 in Hitman 2. Hitman 2 is basically just another season of DLC, and there's a good explanation why, which I'm not going to go in depth in this video, I'll eventually talk about it when I get to that game in the Hitman Retrospective series, but this game has so much fucking content to it, it's insane! You can play one mission, like I probably put 16 hours alone in one level. Level just to try to do everything. This is a game about being meticulous and trying out every option. The only issue is its ever-growing file size. It is insane. This game is larger than Red Dead 2 at this point, I'm pretty sure. Also, it's confusing-ass Steam page that I have to explain to friends every time they want to buy this game and they have no idea what version to get. Can you guys at IO, I know none of you are watching, but please, for the love of God, fix the fucking Steam page. And my final game should come at no surprise, Devil May Cry 5. This was everything it needed to be. It was my favorite game of 2019. Playing this game filled me with unexplainable joy and happiness. Look, the Google API even says so. Just playing this game for a few minutes, you can feel the quality that you just can't get anywhere else. I can't think of a single time playing through DMC5 where I ran into a bug or something that made me go, huh, that doesn't seem right. Unlike when I played tons of other difficult, high execution execution requiring sword games. I'm really glad they experimented with a different kind of gameplay style with V. Hey Atlas, just copy what they did with V and make another Raido Kusanoa game. All I'm waiting for is the Virgil DLC and a mod to let Bloody Palace be co-op so I could fuck around with my friends. And with that, that was my 15 favorite games of the decade.
If you've made it this far into the video, I just want to say thanks for watching as always. Here's to hoping that 2020 is going to be a great year for the channel. I have a ton of stuff planned and I hope you stick around to see it all come out. If you're interested in updates and seeing shitty memes and stuff from me, follow me on Twitter. If you really like the channel, maybe consider becoming a patron on Patreon. I have a TCG affiliate link if you're a Yu-Gi-Oh player or a Magic the Gathering player or just a card game player in general. Just click the link below and buy anything on the website and that will help support the channel. Tune back in in a few days where I talk about my most disappointing pointing games of the decade, because there was quite a few of them. Some of them may even be sequels to games that were on this list. But as always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.